11 year old boy has become the youngest person to be prosecuted in connection with the London riots. These images that we see daily on our television screens are corrupting the image of young people. The appeal of the news is wearing thin for us, but yet as a future generation, we are the people that need to be most engaged within the news. Last Wednesday, the Lumberjacks brought in a plethora of talented high school players to their football the uh, point of the last uh, match in the regular season, it was a little bit emotional. Somewhat organic, and they've, yeah. they've been a little bit fortunate yeah. in yeah. signing just, you know, Durant. It's just so uh, different to watch. You know, now <laughs> Boogie Cousins. And, uh, but it's just but, exciting. Everyone's very, very pumped up. They drafted the, the right guys. They trained those guys. They've kept the team together. That reminds me of the Spurs. Is in, attracts a lot of interest from championship clubs, especially Derby County, who's seen Keane from bringing the winger in on loan move. Yeah, Atkins and Stanley have extended a loan deal of midfielder Sadio Diallo from Wolverhampton until the end of the season. And finally, my guy, <laughs> Salford City, they've signed Tom Elliott after his release from Millwall. The striker signs on a two and a half year deal. Did you do this on purpose? I did. It. No, seriously, did it, was it was an actual purpose. accident. Right, that's enough of that now. That's enough of that. Plenty to come this morning. West Ham fans, we want to hear from you. The first one I always ask people to do is just introduce yourself and yeah, introduce yourself and what you do. <coughs> You're smiling about it. Um, yeah, uh, JD Dyer, uh, 26, uh, a television sports presenter. Okay, so for me, one of the main questions I always ask is there are certain experiences that you've had as a child, and yeah. whether it be positive, negative, or whatever, but there's certain experience you've had as a young person that have shaped the, the, the person that you are today. That could have been a certain club, that could have been family, it could have been a, even something like a trip that you went on and something that inspired you. Yeah. What, would you what do you think um, early experiences you had that have shaped the person that you are today? Um, early experiences, I would say probably traveling a lot. I have to give my mum a lot of credit because I, I grew up in North London, I grew up in Enfield, uh, so it's easy to get kind of confined. Anyone that knows Enfield will know it's easy to kind of get confined to the streets and you can get lost. But um, my mum made it kind of an objective to ensure that we saw the world. So we, we travelled a lot. We, uh, my mum's a travel agent, in fairness to her, but she always made sure she brought her kids with her. And my dad did as well, but like my mum predominantly made sure that we travelled with her. So I saw a lot of the Caribbean very early um saw new york i saw i saw things that made me think bigger than just the block or the ends or the estate so my mind was very open in terms of having different communication to people from different backgrounds around the world to know that there's so much more out there and you can pretty much do anything so i, I met all types of people people that have been successful um at the highest level from very very early uh, people that got to success quite late and then to those that had made bad decisions in life and then found themselves in bad situations um, and that was all part of just the sponge that was my brain when I was younger just kind of taking it all in. Okay and that kind of triggers a question in my mind in the sense that I'm being fortunate as one of those people that my mum actually took me to the Caribbean quite early mm -hmm. and I got to see that side of the world and I think what made an impact on me as I got older was seeing people in positions of power that look like me and also the advertisements. You might think, oh, no, it's just the advertisement, but to see advertisements all over the place with people that look like you, that has an impact on Facts. you. Do you think that had an impact on you, just seeing people that have roles yeah. that you would want to aspire to? 100%, because um, even from young, my dad had this thing that he installed into all of us, where we're kings and queens. Do you know what I mean? So within my family, it's very common that I, I'll greet people and say, what's going on, king? Why go on, king? Do you know what I mean? Because my dad wanted us to always understand that you might not see the imagery in front of you that you're royalty, but you need to understand you come from a royal blood bloodline and be proud of who you are, the people that you've come from, the people that have paved the way for you, and more importantly, your culture. So I think not only hearing it, but then seeing it, it very much added to, I mean, look, I'm still British, I'm still born here, mm -hmm. but it just, it made me understand that I'm twofold. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I'm not just 
an, an English person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not just a British person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm an, I'm, I'm an Antiguan, I'm mm -hmm. a Monstration, I'm, I'm a Caribbean man, mm -hmm. but also even deeper than that, I'm an African. Mm -hmm. So it made me appreciate who I was from every single facet because my dad said, there's no point in you sitting there telling me all the plans you want to do and you don't know where you've come from. Wow. So quite profound. Uh, in, like every single young person, we have to go to school eventually. Fact. I wanted to ask about <laughs> what were your school days like? Um, my school experience was split. That's mm -hmm. what I tell everybody. Um, I started off in a, and I say it, I started off in a, in a local school that was, in the end, like, it was quite a good school. Like, I'm at All Saints. Shout out to anyone that's actually been there. Uh, started off really good. Uh, Heart of Edmonton. Um, I actually met my best, my, one of my best friends, I say one of them, one of my best friends there. So we've been friends since we were four. And still, I actually just got off the phone with him on the way here. So okay. still friends to this day. And um, it helped shape me that in the beginning, but you're talking about a classroom that was like 30 people, um, kids predominantly Afro-Caribbean or African. And it was, so that's all I knew from the ages of, I would say maybe four to, to 11. That's all I knew. So I didn't, I, I don't think, and any interaction I had with white people before then, I would turn around and say was, like passing and going. And the reason why I say that was because I got to about 10, 11, and my mum realised the school was going to Terma. Like, okay. Ofsted was in there, we had nothing but supply teachers. Oh, wow. Um, so it was, it was really, it took a really bad turn mm -hmm. in terms of the school education. And my mum felt like I was getting lost in it. She said that um, the school reports were very, very simple. It was, your son is smart, your son is ahead of the curve. And I was in the highest set with another, uh, another guy from around the area called uh, Benjamin Treasure. I know he's doing good things. He actually went to work uni, um, did brilliant things, you know what I mean? But he was always, he loved school. I wouldn't turn around and say that at that point I loved school, but I knew I was smart. I knew that my teachers thought I was smart. Um, so, but I also was, and I'll say it on the record, I was extremely popular. So I was popular with kids in the year above me, popular with kids in the year below me, and I liked it. I liked being the popular kid. Mm -hmm. And I think when I was younger, I didn't really think I understood the balance between being popular and understanding why you're going to school. And I think my mum could start to, start to, start to see that. Really do. Yeah. So she did what I would turn around and say most parents would want to do, but she made a, an in, incredibly brave move and took me out of that school, which I, I hated at the time. Like, when I say I hate, I didn't hate the school, I hated the decision she had made. Um, and took me to a completely different school, a school well out of the area, um, far, far away into a, an environment that could only be described as enclosed. So I went from a school of 30 where the kids are all black, um, all from the same sort of background and area as me, understood and culturally we were just there, to an all white school. Mm -hmm. And I was dumped into that environment and told I had to adapt pretty much straight away. And I realized the difference then between the education systems of schools that were smaller and education was the focus. Um, I went to a classroom that was 12. Mm. So you're talking wow. about, That's it's, it's almost individual yeah. tuition. <laughs> yes. The teacher can, and we had a teaching assistant in the classroom as well. Wow. So you're talking about, that is one on one almost. So they look at it as, as a teacher to almost every six kids. And so there wasn't any opportunities for mucking around. Within that same setup, my school day went from nine to three, which was normal at Latimer to 8.30 to 4.30. Okay. And you would spend, school would finish at 3.30 at St. John's, which was my second school. Um, but then for the next hour, you would stay after school. Everyone would compulsory and do homework in front of the teachers. So it was a completely different mentality. But what I did realize was all of those friends that I made at my second school, their parents and their tutors and their, and their minds were so far advanced in terms of what they wanted to do. Some of them already were talking about university. I didn't even, I didn't even know what university was. Mm. Some of them were saying, I wanted to be doctors, I wanted to be lawyers, I want to follow what my dad does, I want to be in the, I want to be in the same business. And I realised right there and then, um, probably some of the pitfalls of education in terms of how they don't really help certain environments and they want to help other environments but then at the same time I also realised that I was I was given a great opportunity. I mean don't get twisted, I had some struggles with my mum. Like we went through some back and forth like why have you put me in this school? I'm talking to people about Jay Z and they're talking to me about Slipknot and Alien Amp Farm and I'm okay, just like well, lost. Yeah, that's yeah. That's such a <laughs> lost. 
Um, but my mum said, look, you need, to, you need to get through this because it's important for your development. It's important for you understanding the next steps. And it, it's probably the best decision she ever made. Mm. So obviously your, your biggest support would have been your family, of course. Mm -hmm. But are there any key moments where you realise that for example, you told me that you're, you you moved school deliberately for certain reasons uh -huh. and you, that you couldn't stay in that environment. Is there anything that realised that made you realise that okay, I'm bigger and better than all of everything that you was going through? Is there any moments? Um, I think it it was about fourteen, fifteen. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I, I did my GCSEs. Anyone that's watching would know what GCSEs are. I got straight A's and B's and didn't try. If I'm being honest with you. Um, I actually did the whole revision sessions with my, my god sister, Andrea, and she, she's such a hard working, <laughs> intelligent okay. young lady and was helping me basically get through it just to stay focused. But then I got through my GCSEs and I got all A's and B's and I was like, oh, this is, this is easy. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'd, to that point, I'd done the SATs before that and I got 877. So, and I was saying to you before I did the SATs before that, I got three fives. So school for me had been easy. Um, and I was playing football as well. I was playing football competitively. So I was playing for like um, a trials with Crystal Palace and Reading and, and was around that academy set up at like Northampton Town and things like that. So it was, I was looking at it like life's easy. I mean, couple that with being popular, known in your area. I think to myself, this is, this, is, this is easy through life, right? And then I say about 14, 15, my life kind of changed. Um, I had my first failure. Mm. I didn't, I didn't do, sorry, maybe about a little bit later actually, maybe 16, 17, I started doing ASs, dropped out of, fo I dropped out of football first of all, and then started doing my ASs and failed. Yeah. Failed everything, I failed, I think I got, my, from my ASs, I think I got a C, E, and a U. Okay. Um, and at that point, I didn't even really know how I was gonna respond. Um, I'd lost, like growing up in the area as well, I'd lost some people close to me, like in terms of had gone down the wrong path and I lost some family members. So then I started to, I would say, go the complete opposite of my mentality, what my mentality had been the whole time. This whole time I had been developed in my mind to believe I was a champion and a king. And then all of a sudden you're given your first real failures in life and how does royalty respond? Like, are you gonna respond and do the things that you've been installed in you from young or are you gonna do the complete opposite and become a product of your environment? And for a little while I got lost, um, just wrong, running with the wrong crowd, thinking I was something I wasn't. And I think I just hit a realisation when my mum looked at me one time and she just turned around and said to me, I don't really know who you are at this moment in time. That must have been painful. Hella painful. And that's when I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to make sure I, I do what? I was designed to do and destined to do and what my mind, what I've been writing down for the longest while um, and telling myself that I was going to do. And from our previous conversations, I know in the past some teachers had said some things that are not particularly as supportive uh, at all. Yeah. They, they could see that. Um, and this is where I say to you already about the education system, they could see probably that there was gaps in my knowledge just as a mature, as a, as a maturity. I probably was talking a lot wiser than I actually understood naturally as any age. And I would say, and I would say on the records, teachers from um, the sixth form that I went to and teachers from a teacher and a couple of other teachers from St. John's. Um, the sixth form that I went to was Dave Malisone, if anyone wants to know. Um, they tried to keep me down. And when I say that they, were, they could see that I was losing interest, they could see, and at that point, I tell people all the time, your teacher, alongside your parent and those cr critical age between like maybe 14 and 18 are supposed to guide you. They're supposed to Absolutely. almost be your parents during from nine to three um, or nine to five, whatever it is. And they could see that I was getting lost, could see that I was losing interest, could see that I was becoming complacent is the word that I used to describe it now. And certain teachers use that as an advantage to kick me further down, 100%. Like they, they didn't like the way I was talking, they didn't like who I, what I said I was going to become. I even told a teacher that I was going to be a sports presenter and she laughed in my face. Oh wow. She told me straight, you haven't got the grades, the ability or the credentials to do that. How are you going to be on, I had long braids, mm -hmm. how are you going to be on TV with braids? Someone said, I can be on TV with whatever I like. Um, well, 
as the famous Big Sean says, I can't see you from this side of the TV now. So I just turned man, I just used it all later on as motivation. Sure. But in the beginning, when I was maybe 14, 15, I couldn't, I couldn't really understand it. I couldn't really fathom it. But I understand now a little bit as I get older, some people are designed to do that. What made you want to be in media? What made you want to be a sports presenter? Uh, I've, always, I've always wanted to do it. Um, I have... I've, I would say to you, I, I was doing, and I didn't even realise it, when I was playing ball, um, I was so much more interested in the post-match and pre-match <laughs> than I ever was actually engaged in the actual 90 minutes. And don't get twisted, obviously, I, I was a good player, I was, I was alright, so the 90 minutes were fun but I was so much more in love with reaction and, and pre-match rituals. I used to, and this is word of, my cousin is a, a coach at Spurs um, my other and his brother is a teacher and they both played in the academy system. One played at Barnet, um, other co my cousin played at Arsenal and Spurs. And when we used to play Pro Evolution in the bedroom and stuff like that, all chilling, playing PlayStation, I didn't want to play. I wanted to commentate. <laughs> It's so weird to turn around and say that and fathom that now, but um, I, we, we laugh about it now, but those little steps were things that were in my brain from early. And the best thing someone ever said to me is, if you want something, you need to write it down on paper. And I found it the other day, what I wrote to myself at 14, saying that I was going to be on this and I was going to do that and I was going to be a sports presenter. And I've had so many ups and downs through the way, naturally as you are, and I will have more ups and downs but I knew probably a lot earlier than I even probably understood. What was your first gateway into the field then for you? Uh, first role? What, first paid or first? First role full stop, paid uh, or not paid? 40, 14 years old, uh, my uncle Phil, uh, well I give him a shout out now, Phil Simmons is my uncle, he's the famous West Indian cricketer. Really? Is my wow. uncle. Okay. Um, so he gave me a work experience okay. at Sky Sports because obviously at that time West Indies cricket was, was through the roof. 14 mm -hmm. years old and he managed to get me a work experience with a woman called Pippa Burke. And I still haven't met her. Now I work at Sky. I still haven't met her. I think she's left actually. Um, and I did uh, two days of Soccer AM. I did two days of Gillette Soccer Saturday. What's so funny is the people then that I was shadowing and doing my work experience with, they obviously now my colleagues, they still remember me. They said to remember me at that time, which is... That's brilliant, yeah. Weird to say, but um, I, I think when I had the opportunity to come into an actual professional environment and see it and realise that I was, could be a part of the set and shadowing and asking the relevant questions, I knew then that no matter what anybody says to you, this is possible. It is possible. Like, it is... You do have the ability to do this because you're asking the people as to how they got into it and not everybody's path is going to be the same but you need to now understand that once you visualize it that's the first step in actually making it happen okay so you've gone and you've had your work experience mm -hmm. but then what's your first role where you thought to myself oh good i've actually got a foot in the door here i'm actually doing something that's going to add to my add to my worth not as a just someone that's employed mm -hmm. in your career but just as your general being i did a uh, I did a work experience. After that, I, I became obsessed. So I started writing down people that I idolised and my mentor, who I wanted my mentors to be and what my final visions were going to be. And I didn't even realise. Now I'm doing higher reading. At 14, 15, you shouldn't really be thinking like that. Mm -hmm. um, and bear in mind, I'm still playing football at this time and okay. I'm writing down what my final dream is and it's got nothing to do with football. Mm -hmm. um, but what I started to realise by doing that, I was manifesting what, what was in my brain and just writing it down. And from there, I, when I say I became obsessed, I wanted to do a work experience at the BBC. I wanted to do a work experience at ITV. I wanted to do a work experience at The Voice, which is the, one of my favorite papers still to this day. Um, I wanted to get a worldly, well, more renowned understanding for what this industry was and really understand whether or not it was something I wanted to take on. And once I had done that, I realized the positives and I'd realized the negatives of it. And from there, I was able to navigate my career because my career is not a simple trajectory yeah, it's, not, it's, not, it's never yeah, like that, yeah. It, 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 <laughs> and everyone will say they have their own but mine is so obscure in terms of the direction that i decided to go in it ended up being the best best thing and it was all came from me diving into those experiences really early okay i wanted to ask you about there's normally a moment 
but and it happened in my job where I thought okay yes this is what I'm supposed to be doing I've had the feeling that I should be doing it mm. I believe in my head I should be doing it but then you have a physical experience that wow this experience has been so amazing yeah. that I want to do this for the rest of my life yeah what was yours I mean I've, I've, I've had a few mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to know my first moment where it was like that I would say to you um, I was 18 years old I was so I struggled after my A-levels. I to be honest with you, I wanted to become a DJ like, okay. with, with my boy. Mm -hmm. We was going to go to Iron Apple. <laughs> I'll say the story now. We were going to go to Iron Apple, my boy Ben, and we were going to be superstar DJs. We were working in a bar during the summer. Uh, we were going to be DJs in Iron Apple and we were, gonna, we were basically going to become the new MC, MC Neat and DJ. Is it DJ like an MC Neat? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's it. Um, that's what we were saying to ourselves we wanted to do. But then, at the same time, we had still both had university in the back of our mind. Mm -hmm. uh, if I remember correctly, he needed to just change one of his grades and I needed to change uh, my English grade to get to the universities that we wanted to get to. But uh, over that summer, I had taken a lot of contemplation as to whether or not I actually felt I wanted to go to uni. Uh, so what I actually did was I applied for this competition, uh, the ITV holds with breaking um, with Media Trust okay. called Breaking Into News. So I was actually a finalist in the first year. Oh, wicked. Uh, but what I didn't actually realize is when I sent my application in, is a lot of the other finalists who came from all around the country, mm -hmm. um, and there was thousands and thousands of applications, they were all maybe three, four years older than me, had all come to the end. What well, most of them were coming to the end of their university tenure, okay. and were looking for maybe a gateway into the into the industry straight away. I hadn't even started that, mm -hmm. and it really took me aback that I hadn't done any sort of apart from my work experiences. I hadn't done any sort of professional media training as of yet, and yet I still made it to the finals. That, I think that something. was the first time that actually resonated in my brain <laughs> that maybe you're a little bit further ahead than you think in this. So if you invest a little bit more time into this, you could really become. You're everything. Okay. So, how did you end up at Sky Sports working at Sky Sports then? Um, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> what a journey. Um, after university, mm -hmm. I, I went to America. I decided to. What I realised through all the work experiences is what a lot of people were turning around and saying to me there's no spaces, you have to kind of wait in the queue. I have a real problem with waiting in the queue. Um, and I didn't really feel like I wanted somebody else to dictate how my career was going to be. So I wasn't going to sit in an office for, and there's nothing, I got no, no beef of anybody Everyone doing wants this. to go on a different path. But I, had, I knew what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. and, and I know loads of people in the industry say, oh, I want to be a presenter, I want to be a reporter. Um, but I knew I wanted to be. And I, I didn't feel there was a need apart from, because I had done the work experience, so I understood how the production and stuff had worked. So I knew I didn't need to there was, even though I loved that part, I, it's not what I wanted to invest every single moment of my time into. So after university, I took the biggest gamble and spoke to my lecturer and asked her to help me get a job abroad. Um, she sat down with me, helped me fill in so many applications, gave me links to websites, actually helped me out at a previous television station she had worked at, um, and done, <laughs> done a screen test and all the rest of it and, and managed to go to Arizona for just about over a I want to say what, 15, 16 months. Oh wow, that's um, a long stretch. Right? In, in game in that community. Now imagine 21 years old, mm -hmm. you, you decide to fly halfway across the world to a community I'd never heard of, done a whole bunch of research on, on the plane, on the way there, into the, all their sporting teams, all of their sporting franchises. It was just lucky I loved the American culture beforehand. So I knew of the Cardinals and I knew of the Diamondbacks and I knew of, of the Phoenix Suns, but I wanted to know it on a deeper level because that's just the surface. The average fan can tell you that. I wanted to know the college teams, the ASUs, the Sun Devils. I wanted to know the, the Wildcats, why the Wildcats had a history. Um, and even the, the local universities that was close to me, which was the Lumberjacks, the NAU Lumberjacks. I wanted to know everything while integrating myself in that television station. So that nobody could ever turn around and say to me, it wasn't because you didn't work hard enough. And don't get twisted, moving halfway across the world um, was a scary experience, but it's one that has shaped my trajectory because I was able to make mistakes, I was able to learn, I was able to invest with no distractions around me. Like, as much as I loved my friends um, and I loved my girl, girl ex-girlfriend at that time, um, but I didn't want any distractions. I wanted to ingrain myself in my work and my future 
And by doing that and moving halfway across the world, and my friends will call me every other day, but I was able to invest all of my time and energy into becoming better. Now, I tell people all the time, a year is a long time. Especially a year is a long time if you're focused and you know what you want to do. And by being focused, I was able to fast track the process. So it wasn't, ah, oh, I go and do a two minute news report and then I'm going home to sleep. I think myself, my work's done. I went back home, I went back into the studio afterwards. I tried to learn from leading anchors. I, I was the first one there and the last one to leave every other day. And, and it was because I wanted it that bad. And by doing that, I then realised that I had outgrown the television station to an extent Like I could have stayed there and still been chilling in Arizona. Decent money, nice apartment, all the rest of it. But I wanted so much better for myself when I started looking at those dreams that I'd written down at 14, 15. I said to myself, how am I going to get there? And I met a good friend of mine, he's still a good friend of mine from Arizona, and he said to me, he introduced me to this book called Steve Harvey. Um, think like a success, act like a success. And I was able to write down my whole vehicle for how I was going to get to where I wanted to get to. And it included me coming back here to get a master's. By doing a master's, I had to support myself. I was living in Wales, did my master's at Cardiff Uni. Okay. Um, worked at BBC Sport in Wales. Um, and then moved to Manchester. It didn't quite work out in Manchester for different reasons. And by leaving Manchester, but by getting all of those experiences and those reps that I had done, in America and whatever else, I was then able to come. I sat down and met, which is one of the best people I've ever met in the industry, Andy Cairns, who said that he saw something in me before I even saw it in myself. So he gave me an opportunity to shine. Okay. And from there, I've been at Sky now for, on the record, over a year, over a year and a bit. So, and it's been one of the best experiences of my life, part of this part of my journey. For people who, they might think, oh, you just, jump on camera and you do this Facts. X, Y, and Z, but mm -hmm. it's not actually the case. What's a normal day for you in terms of preparation? And I know for the transfer window, there must've been a lot of preparation involved. Um, I would say I'm even more critical now. I even prepare, I prepare more now than I ever did when I was younger. Uh, when I was younger, I was, I thought I was preparing, but I wasn't. Uh, I, I literally would say to you, my typical preparation day, say I have an interview at one o'clock, I'd be, prepared from, I'd be prepped from the night before. Mm -hmm. So I'd spend maybe two, three hours digging into that person or digging into that team or digging into that situation from the night before. Um, from any of my NBA shoots that anyone's watched it, the preparation, I can tell you now, I come with a list of notes that much and I probably only use maybe a page, but it's just the fact that there could be nothing that can be thrown at me that I'm not aware of. There could be nothing that I can't adapt to you are the vehicle and the body that is supposed to turn around and give the audience the subject that they're tuned in for. So I need to, as the vehicle, be the safest, be the fastest, be the smoothest, be the most understanding of any situation and any subject that I'm, I'm sitting in front of. And people don't understand and people will turn around and say, oh, you just wake up and you, you just, you. the camera skills are one thing, but there is no replacement for hard work and there is no replacement for preparation. Big Sean just re re released a freestyle on Funk Flex okay. and he talks about it, poor preparation leads to poor execution. Like, you need to understand the vehicle that leads up to the time that is spent on screen. It's not, I wake up and I wish I could just wake up and say to myself, yeah, you know what, I feel good today. And I probably could, but I'm never gonna put myself in that situation where I feel like I don't know if this is gonna go well. I don't know if this is going to be as I want it to be. Don't get twisted, there's nerves. There's nerves every time I go on screen. But it, the nerves are relaxed and they are Fuel. supported by a whole heap of preparation that's gone before that. So recently, just watching sports, just watching sports on TV recently, uh -huh. I'm seeing people like Jordan Jarrett Bryan, yeah. Jeanette Kwachi, mm -hmm. um, Samantha Johnson, who's working in Turkey. Yeah. There's a whole host of new faces from People normally say BME, BME, but just across the board, even Alex Scott. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, why is diversity in sport important? All of those people you just named, I've worked with, and all those people are, are excellent at their job. And it's about time that they deserve to be highlighted for how good they are at their job. I see the work that they've all put in. I see the work that they've done in their careers. I've spoken to them all individually about how hard it is to do what we do not only because you represent a community that doesn't always get highlighted in the right way, but because 
there is no room for mistake for us. Like, I don't know if anyone's seen the documentary that was BBC Three. Um, I can't even remember what it's called. Uh, is it Bigger and Blacker or B Blacker and Better? But there's one quote that was said when they were talking to so many different people from what, from the, especially just from the black community. And they were talking about how we can never be as good. We always have to be better. Yeah. And when, they, when that word were, were said, and I couldn't even remember to tell you off the top of my head who said it, but it, it struck such a chord in my heart because I'd heard that throughout my whole life in my own household. And to understand that other people that are in the same field as me, same walk of life as me, are, are experiencing the same thing, tells me everything that I needed to know about the way I'm going to be going forwards and everything that I've experienced previously. The diversity is important because look at the world that we live in. Look at the world that we need to represent on screen, in, in production, in management positions, even in senior positions, the world that is out there. That is, that is the fundamental. I'm, I'm sick and tired of seeing mistakes made about players being put up by the wrong name and a certain quotation or not knowing the right terminology because that lets me know that within that meeting room or within that organisation, there wasn't enough conversation with people from that background. If you, I can never turn around and tell somebody how to feel about a situation. But what I can turn around and tell you is, as someone that comes from a community, how the majority of people are going to look at a situation. And that's why diversity is important. Because I'm going to give you a completely different insight to an insight that you have. And that will only elevate what is going to be your production, your show, your, your, your mind, the ideas you come up with. Like, why would you not encourage having more people and more diverse ideas in a room? Because of the journey that you've been on, uh, for anyone that's had similar experiences, in, whether it be schooling, whether it be your vision in terms of getting where you want to go, what advice would you give to them? Um, I live by the four agreements. Don't take anything personal. Um, be true to your words. I <laughs> like always give your best. And uh, there is nothing bigger than setting out your plan and executing it and following it. That's, that's as simple as I can get. Like, there are going to be tens of thousands of people that's going to turn around and tell you you can't do something. If I showed you my DMs right now for the amount of people that's turned around and tried to abuse me, turned around and told me that, oh, you shouldn't be doing this, don't talk about this, who are you? And at the same time, there's hundreds of DMs of people turned around and telling me, thank you for doing what you're doing, keep going. Like, trust me when I say this, you were all behind you. And, and I mean this when I say this, not in, a, not in a bad way. I take both at the same sort of level. I take the ones that want to get to know me and want little bits of advice, always message back. Always turn around and say to you, whatever I can do to help you, even if it's a word, if it's a bit of an encouragement, even if it's just an acknowledgement, say thank you, I will always try my best. I, I'm, I'm not on my socials like because of management or whatever else, but I always make sure that I sign in and I tell people around me, don't you dare remove anything. If someone sends a request and, then, and they're asking for advice or they're asking for a bit of help, don't you dare ever remove that because I remember what it was like to be that, mm. that 15, 16 year old person trying to send an email, trying to send a text message, trying to find out, DM someone on LinkedIn, please, can you just give a bit of advice? So that part is so important. I'm not turning around and telling you I'm the finished article, nowhere near. And anybody that's going to follow my career or my personal life or where I'm going to go, you'll see where I'm going to take this. But at the same time, I never forget as to the feelings that I had in the beginning. And if I can do anything to help, then I 100% I will. 1000% I will. And at the same time, to all those that want to turn around and abuse, keep them coming. Because if you haven't realised by now, I use it as motivation. So you're only making me better. And to all those that's going to put themselves in situations where they might be subject to that, enjoy it. Because if you weren't relevant and you weren't doing something that they hated on, trust me when I say this to you, they wouldn't comment. If you weren't good, they wouldn't comment. If you weren't doing something that fuels something that's deep inside them, they wouldn't comment. This society here, everyone wants everything now. Oh my gosh, I need this now. 
I blame Instagram, I blame all the rest of it. Am I on it? Yeah, of course I am. But at the same time, I'm not a slave to it because I'm enjoying the process. So my advice to anybody would be, write your goals, but this is the part I'm enjoying, the journey to getting it. When I finally get to where I want to get to, and I tell people all the time, say it out loud, I will have my own television show. I will executive produce it, I will present it, I will front it, and I will have a whole bunch of mix of celebrities and normal people come on there and we'll do the interview platform. But at the same time, enjoy the journey. Enjoy getting there. Enjoy every single person that's trying to punch you in your gut. And at the same time, enjoy every person that's there picking you up and tapping you on your back. Because they are all part of your journey to where you want to be. I asked this question to everybody, but you've pretty much already answered it. Um, what mark would you like to leave on earth and what do you want people to remember you as? Um, I'm going to tell you something personal because I'm going to say something personal because of the sheer fact of how we've interacted. Like, we've only spoken on the phone a few times, yeah. but it's been organic and been 100% above board. So what I'm about to say to you, I don't even think many of my... I would say only probably my inner circle know, but I'm willing to turn around and tell you so that people can understand. Because what my friends have turned around and said to me now is that you need to start telling people about the things you're doing behind closed doors. The mark I want to leave, leave from a broadcasting perspective is... I want to be not someone that was known as being real, first of all. Coming from where I came from and finishing off where I finished, I want people to know that that person has remained the same throughout. I mean, there has been some people that's turned around and will throw slant on my name, leave them. Like, you were never probably in my corner in the first place. From a personal perspective, I have a charity foundation. Okay. And I build schools in Africa. Wow. So I, I have did built not a, know that. I built a school in Zambia. Wow. Me and my best friend, He's one of my trustees. We went over to Zambia in 2017. We built a school over there. My own money, hands down. I can, I'll turn around and show you the stuff afterwards. No, I believe you, man. No, I believe you. You can see by my face I'm happy that we, you've done that. We, yeah. we launched a charity in 2017, and it's something that I've kept close to my heart only because I felt it was, because of the kids, it, it was so vulnerable. And I didn't want anybody to turn around and use what I'm doing in the spotlight in the media against what how vulnerable, how precious those kids are. We took a, a school that was on the verge of closing down from 35, that had 35 kids in it. Um, we went over there, we built a new classroom, new school, give them new facilities. This year we sent them 1,500 textbooks. We've taken that school in that district in Chongwei and we have built them a new, new facility, new educational standard because we wanted to then elevate a whole new community. Why did I do Africa first? Because I said to you earlier, I'm a Caribbean man because the box I tick, but I know for a fact that we all started in Africa. Mm -hmm. So it felt right to start that in Africa. 2020, going forward, I want to do my next foundation in, in Antigua because okay. that's where my people come from. Yeah. So I've already started having conversations with certain members of the High Commission Board and over there in the UK so that we can start doing stuff over there next year. The reason why I say this is because that legacy that I'm, what I'm building there will live forever. People will know the broadcaster, the personality, and like I said, the direction I'm going to go in in terms of the whole platform. But I want people to understand that my vision and my, my bond with things that are deeper is so much more succinct than anything that I'm doing on TV. I want, the reason why I decided to pick Africa is because those kids are, they appreciate the stuff that we give them. They appreciate the new class and I, sit, I get videos every day of just them saying hi. For me, that's all the fuel I need. That's all the fuel I need. If I can turn around and do that in certain lineage, certain lineage countries that I know and that mean the world to me, that's all the legacy that I need.